this guy. Okay, let me just. Right, I was supposed to record it. Okay, we, we didn't get the prayer, but that's all right. Um, today we're going to look at chapters 19 and 20 so that hopefully next week we can look at chapters 21 and 22 and you will be finished until September. Uh, we, would have we would have finished um, the book. So, and, and then what are we going to do next? What's the uh, Bible story that we're going to do next? So. Uh, I know you're anxious to find out. I will tell you at next week. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you next week, Bryce. He hasn't decided. <laughs> oh, actually, I have. But um, actually, I have. But uh, I'll tell you next week. <laughs> So today, um, I would like someone, let me see, I would like someone to read chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, and then another person to read chapter, um, verses 11 to 21, and then um, chapter 20, verses 1 to 6, and then from verses 7 to 18. So who would like to read? Um, Carol, we read nineteen, chapter nineteen, verses one to ten. Did I hear you as well, Robert? Yes. Right, okay, Robert, we'll read verses eleven to twenty-one of chapter nineteen. Did I see your hand, Marilyn? Sure. Uh, you will read verse one to six of chapter twenty, and someone to read the last part. I'll read the last part. And, okay, oh. Okay, Bryce, I heard, I heard you first. Um, Bryce will read the last part. Okay, good. Uh, can you begin first, Carol? Yes. Um, after these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous for he has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality and he has avenged the blood of his bond servants on her. And a second time they said, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, give praise to our God, all you his bond servants, you who fear him, the small and the great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. Um, continue, Robert. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dripped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth came a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
and I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals and mighty men of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slaves, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. All the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Thank you, Robert. Marilyn? And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He sees the dragon, that, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and locked and sealed it over him so that he would deceive the nations. No, I'm sorry. So he would deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be let out for a little while. Then I saw thrones and those seated on them were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God. They had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with the Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him a thousand years. Thank you, Marilyn. Yes, Bryce. Uh, what verse do I start reading, Paul? Seven, just... verse seven. Okay, seven. When the thousand years come to an end, Satan will be let out of let out of his prison. He will go to deceive the nations, and he will be called God and Magdalene in every corner of the earth. He will gather them together for battle, a mighty army as number as numberless as sand along the seashore. And I was them, and I saw them as they went up on the on the board plain of the earth and surrounding God's people and the beloved city. But the fire from heaven came down from the attacking armies and consumed them. Then the devil who deceived them was thrown into a fiercy lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they were to be tortured day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on the earth in the sky fled his presence, but they found no place to hide. Then I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were open, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done. And as recorded in the books, the sea gave up its dead, and the death and the, death and the grave gave up their dead and all they were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire was the second death, and anyone whose name was not found in the recording in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Thank you, Bryce. So thank you, Carol and Robert and Marilyn and Bryce. Thank you. All right. Um, I, at least I think this week's two chapters are a little easier to read than some others that we have read before, you think? Yeah, it's not as complicated. <laughs> um, last week, we started off um, looking at this section, which is called A, victory, a Vision of Victory, uh, A Vision of Vindication. 
And we, and, and I mentioned that it was going to be divided into three parts. Last week, we looked at the mystic Babylon and the fall and her fall, the whole portrayal of the sinful world um, uh, um, um, under the symbol of, of Babylon, who is seen as a prostitute or a harlot, and the whole notion of punishment that we'd be meeting out to her. And we found that, and we talked about this whole notion of what Babylon represented in terms of whether it is a group of countries or cities or whoever, but it represents places where um, uh, the kind of lifestyle, the kind of way they are is not fitting in terms of, um, of, of what God wants. And also that such persons are seen as enemies of Christ. Now, today we are going to look at the other two parts of the of the three, the, the three parts vision, uh, we're going to look at the triumph of the redeem, and we are also going to look at the last things, um, which are seven in number, seven being completeness, and so it, it implies that sevenfold completeness. Now today we see um, in chapter 19, verse 1 um, and, and verse 10, we see a, a, a hymn of praise. It's called a hallelujah chorus. Um, um, and, and it follows, and, and you will find that there is some kind of rejoicing or some kind of hymn of praise when after each crisis, and you see this in apocalyptic writing. And so, it, it, and, and what it does is, is that it forms a relief of, to, the, the, to the gravity of the visions, the seriousness, the harshness of the visions. When you hear a hymn of praise, um, it brings a kind of a relief to the gravity of what has preceded. And so this hymn of praise is sung in heaven by this great voice of a, of, of a great multitude of people. And it is, and it is, and it's like a sequel um, to the fall of the city and the lament of the world. And so we will see also then to the marriage supper of the Lamb is announced for those who are the redeemed in Christ. And so when we look at verses one to eight of this whole notion of the of the of the hymn of praise, it is a response to the heavenly summons to rejoice. And we will see that the word hallelujah or God be praised or praise to God is heard in heaven. And you will realize that it is repeated. It is mentioned three times. I think you see it in verse one, and then back in, again in verse three, and then you see it again in verse four, where hallelujah is mentioned three times. And... Um, the first one comes from the voice of a great, a great crowd, a multitude in, in heaven um, who, who, who shouts hallelujah. And then it comes from the four and 20 elders who are the representatives of the redeemed church, um, those who are the apostles and the, and the, um, and the tribes of Israel. And then we have then um, the four living creatures who are representative of all created life. And, and, and they, they, at the end, they shout, Amen, Alleluia. So, so be it, God be praised. And after this, again, in response to a message from the throne, um, another hallelujah is heard from the voice of another crowd. And you will see that in verse 6. And... Um, as the sound of many waters, the voice of those who are praising God in full and in joyful chorus. And the reason why all these hallelujahs are being said or shouted or, or God is being praised in this is because he has more or less avenged the blood of his servants, those who have died, those who were martyrs. God has conquered um, and there's rejoicing with exceeding, exceeding gladness because what is happening is, is that there's now a complete, a complete and final union of Christ with the redeemed church, which is his bride. And you know, the church is always seen as the bride of Christ. And so... That is the reason why there's all these hallelujahs happening, um, because of 
of God avenging um, the blood of his servants by bringing about destruction on those who caused the blood of his servants. So, so we see the word hallelujah then for, occurs four times in this passage, and it is not found elsewhere in the New Testament. And so it should be noted that it is used here as it is chiefly used in the Old Testament in connection with the punishment of the wicked. And as I said, you saw the first voice in the chorus of the hallelujahs is that of a, a multitude of angelic hosts in, in, in heaven. Um, and it's responded to by the, four, by the 24 elders and the four living creatures. And then there's the second voice in verse six, which is a multitude, great number of the universal church who has now been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. And so that's, we, 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 we see these um, hallelujah choruses coming out. And then we see, and, 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 they, and they talked, you know, and they said, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute, which again, as we know, is Babylon. And, and who corrupted the earth by her adulteries, he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again, they shouted, hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne, and they cried, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants. You will fear him, both small and great. Then I heard that sounded like a great multitude, like a roaring of rushing waters, and, the, and, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah. For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. For fine, for li fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. So here we see um, in, this, in this whole section the praise that is being given to God for what he has done and for rewarding them and redeeming the, and redeeming the faithful and, 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 and bringing good out of evil and so forth. So that is what that particular section is talking about. Um, one of the, uh, when we move into to verse nine, then the angel said to me, write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, there are, these are the true words of God. And we find here that John is being directed. Um, John is being directed by an angel to record a blessing upon those who are bidden to the marriage or the wedding supper. In other words, those who are invited to share in a closer fellowship of the redeemed of Christ and to also partake of the spiritual food that awaits them in this new relationship um, in their heavenly life. So that is what John is directed here to do is to write, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. So, so obviously there's a new relationship taking place, new relationships, I should say, taking place. And so John is, 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 is commanded to write about the blessing that is about to take place. Now there's a further symbol of the spiritual union of Christ with the church added to that of the bride and marriage. And, and as I said, that the bride is always seen as, as, as the church. And when it comes to wedding and in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, the bride is always, the church is always symbolic of the bride and, and Christ as the bridegroom. So we see here that there's this symbol of the spiritual union of Christ, of the church with Christ, added to that of the bride in the marriage, and it sets forth the joys of the heavenly life on their familiar figure of a marriage feast. And we know that marriages are meant to be joyous and joyful, and, and the big 
a great big celebration. And so we are seeing that happening here. The spiritual union that exists with Christ and his church are now coming together and, and, and there's a joyous celebration. And so that, that, that symbolism of marriage and of the marriage feast is brought about between Christ and his church. And then we also have the marriage of the lamb is, I just missed someone. Who did I miss? Oh, Bryce. Um, the marriage of the lamb is put in a vivid, is a vivid, and one of the things that we need to realize is, is that this whole wedding supper of the lamb or marriage of the lamb, if you remember last week, we looked we look at the fornication of the harlot, her adulteries. And so we see there is a contrast being brought about here between the wedding supper of the lamb and the fornication of the prostitute. And in verse 10, um, at this, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold in to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony, testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And here we see that the, the Apostle John is so overwhelmed by the impression of the vision, what he's seeing, that he falls at the feet of the angel who has been, who has been commanding him and directed him um, to do certain things. And John is so captivated. John is so impressed by what he's hearing and by what he's seeing that he decides to worship the angel. Um, and, and here we find that the angel refuses to accept the worship. Um, and, um, and, be, and because, as the angel says, I'm like you, I'm a fellow servant. You are a fellow servant, I am a fellow servant. And so, and, 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 and with all the others who are like you and with you, and, and we are all in this together, um, holding toward the testimony of Jesus. We share in that testimony of Jesus. So whereas John is willing as an apostle to kneel down and worship the angel for all that he's saying and doing, the angel is saying, no, we are all in this together. The person that should be worshiped is God himself um, um, or God in Christ for that matter. So when we look at this terminology, the testimony of Jesus, um, there have been different interpretations of it. Some people think it's the witness um, for the truth um, that is borne out by Christ in the world, while others see it as witness born for Christ. So whereas one is seen as the truth born by Christ, others see it as witness born for Christ and, and, and the truth by the disciples in the, in the world. You see the difference in between the two there? Do you all see the difference? Witness born by Christ versus witness born for Christ. Where so 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 that is so there's some still some matter of interpretation as to what the testimony of Jesus is. If it is the truth as spoken by by Christ, or if it's the witness and truth of those who take the truth in the name of Christ, and 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 so. Um, there's, it means one of those two, but no, persons don't seem to be sure as to which one it symbolizes. Um, and then we also have the terminology spirit of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy. And this possibly, it means either that, and again too, there's, there's not a hard and fast on this, but it possibly means either that the message attested by Jesus is the essence of prophetic proclamation. In other words, um, that Jesus's message is, is um, what's the word I want? That Jesus's, the, the, the message which Jesus brings is really that that was proclaimed by the prophets or that the message by Jesus is that which the spirit takes and puts in the mouth of Christian prophets. So in other words, that Jesus' Jesus's message, the Holy Spirit takes Jesus' message and, and puts it into the mouths of prophets who then um, foretells it or speaks about it. 
um, so 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 in other words, then so in other words, one is whether or not is is Jesus is the message of Jesus really the essence of what the prophets proclaim, or which is in other words, did the prophets proclaim this and this is the essence of Jesus's message, or did was it or did Jesus's message come first? And it was placed into the mouths of prophets to proclaim. And that is where um, there's still some variation as in terms of what that interpretation means. Um, and, and then we come to, hold on, am I? Okay, right. So, so that actually is the, the whole notion of the triumph of the redeemed that we see that uh, there is going to be great rejoicing with all the hallelujahs because of what Christ has, what, what, because of what God has done and that God will be praised. He has condemned the great prostitute. He, he has avenged those who, who seek to destroy the faithful. Um, and, and so they start to worship God and to praise God and to thank God for what, what he has, what he has done for them. Any questions on that section before we move on to verse 11? Okay. Was it understandable? Yes. Okay. Okay. Now on to verse 11, um, where now we come now to the last things, and this will go right down to the end of chapter 20. Um, and, and here we see there's an, this is now becoming a new phase of this whole vision of the victory um, is, a, 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 um, is a new phase is now being, um, it's now coming about. It now opens up a new phase. Um, it presents what is, can be seen as the final consummation, sorry, the final um, culmination and crisis of judgment and redemption. So you will see a lot about judgment in this section, along with redemption. Um, it's a kind of like a preview of the closing events of history, of human history. And it, it, it is a foretaste or it, it predicts the whole triumph and completion of the whole age of the gospel, the whole age of the church. Um, and you will find that these events are a series of climaxes that are pretty progressive, oftentimes catastrophic. But what, what they do is that they usher in the final consummation of God's plan for the world. Um, and, this is, and this whole notion about the final consummation of God's plan for the world is, is a feature that is prominent in apocalyptic writings. Because when we think about apocalyptic writings, we always think about the finale. We always think about the finality. And so it is about the final consummation of God's plan for the world. And it should also be noted that the element of, this, of the climax, which, uh, that, uh, which is dominant in Revelation, um, belongs essentially to the mood and to the temper of apocalyptic writing. And, and we must not think that it is God's method um, only of the climax of the end of times. So, so I want you to realize that although there's an element of climax that is, dominated, is, that is dominant in Revelation, that it, this element of climax um, sets the tone, the mood, the temper, um, the form, um, literary form of apocalyptic writings. This is what how apocalyptic writings are, um, and and so and we are not to just uh, we are not to just see it or to see it as revealing God's um, method of how the climax of the end of times will be. So, let us go into the verses 11 to 21, um, to the end of that chapter. And we see, we begin, we see here, um, I saw heaven standing open and there before me a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, 
riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the wine, wine, the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has his, this name written, Kings of Kings and Lords of Lords. And one of the things when I read this, when I, when I first read this in a few, uh, many years ago, but I remember growing up in a child and you will be looking into Bible story books and you will see, you know, Jesus riding on a horse, this white horse and all these other people behind him. Do you ever see anything like that from in the clouds? You've never seen that? None of you? No. Oh no. my gosh. Yes, and, and you never knew, and I always wonder, well, what is this all about? But then they were talking about Revelation, and, and, and you know, the clouds were open, and Jesus on his white horse with a crown on his head and a big cape on, and, and then there were like, others riding behind him, and you could, and, and, and it, it was, it, it, it used to make me wonder, well, what's this all about? But then when you read this, you, you get, you now get what it's about. And this part of the vision is showing us the final victory over all the powers of the world. Um, um, and it's going, and all the powers of the world are going to be uh, attained um, by the supreme power, which is God himself. And so I saw heaven in verse 11, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse and, and Christ appears in the open heaven riding on a white horse. That's the symbolism here of the person who is rider. The rider here is Christ. Um, and, it, and, it, and if you remember earlier in chapter six, there was about, a, we talked about another white horse when it was mentioned with the opening of the seals, but we don't think that this is the same white horse, although it could be because there's a possibility in verse, in chapter six, that it could have been Christ as well. But, but it seems more definitive that here in chapter 19 and verse 11, that it is Christ. And that in this context, in this case, the writer is Christ returning as, a, as the Messiah, as a king, as a warrior. So in other words, now he's coming to do business. The way he was supposed to be the first time he came that the Jews were looking for, somebody who was going to be a warrior and a king and deliver them. Um, he didn't come like that the first time, but it's expected that he will come like that in the second coming. He's called faithful and true in verse 12. Um, sorry, in, in, in still in verse 11, he was, he's called faithful and true. Um, and in righteousness, um, he judges uh, with justice, he judges and makes war. Um, and, we are also, and we are also told that his eyes are like blazing fire. Um, and on his head are many crowns. And the whole notion of his eyes are like blazing fire symbolizes a type of purity, but at the same time, it is also, it um, symbolizes judgment. And on his crown, on his head are many crowns, um, which, which tells us about the whole notion of the possibility of him conquering all the nations. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows but himself, which appears, which could be, or which appears to be the new name that is mentioned in chapter 3, verse 12, a name which John could not interpret. And so we see him on this, with this name. And he's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, which tells us about his redemptive, his redemptive work. Um, um, dying for our, for, for our sins. And then in verse uh, 14, we see the armies of heaven were following him, riding on these white horses and dressed in fine linen. And, and, and it appears that um, the armies of heaven which apparently include the redeemed, such as those who have already entered there. They are the ones who are following him on these white horses. And I know somebody probably want to know why I say they're already there and we're going to come to the whole notion of resurrection shortly. And then we find that out of his mouth um, comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations for he shall rule them with an iron scepter. And he treads 
the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty. And that is, um, and when we hear the term winepress and fury and wrath, you know there is punishment involved and there will be punishment upon the evil. And then in verse 16, on his robe and on his thigh, a name is written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which we know emphasizes who Jesus is. And it emphasizes, it tells us who Jesus, that, that is Jesus, and it emphasizes the whole supreme sovereignty of him. And then in verses 17 and 18, and I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and generals and mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. And what we see here is a kind of a very forbidden and awful contrast to the wedding supper of the lamb in verse 9 that we just talked about there, where, the, 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 where, where um, John says that an angel said to him, he wants him to write down this whole notion of those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. Now, this is in contrast to that, because here we are talking about um, coming together for a great supper of God so that you can eat the flesh of people kings and generals and mighty men and so forth. And, and uh, what is, and what we are seeing here is, is that um, in, in this case, is this grim, this, this forbidden, this awful um, comparison to the wedding feast um, of the lamb there. And this whole notion of coming together for the great supper of God um, and, 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 and all this um, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and, and, and all of that is just symbolic, not that, um, that obviously that you're going to be doing that, but it's just a symbolism. And then in verse 90, we see here, then I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into a fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds gorge themselves on their flesh. So you see in verse 19, this whole notion of seeing the beasts and the kings of the earth and the armies gathering for this war against Christ and his army. And the beast here mentioned is the first beast that came out of the sea. And obviously the kings of the earth, their armies, and they're gathering together to make war against Christ and his kingdom uh, so as to try to overcome them. But we realize that in verse 20, the beast was captured. And the false prophet um, who performed the miraculous signs on his behalf was also captured. And in this case, the false prophet is the second beast. And, um, and remembering the symbolism behind the beast, one beast is world power, one beast is world religions. Um, the first beast is world power, the second beast is world religion. And so we see that both beasts are captured. Um, they both misguided the people. Well, the, first, the, the second beast misguided people in spiritual things, and they're seen to be um, cast into this lake of fire, this, this, fiery, this fiery lake um, of burning sulfur. Um, while all their followers are slain with a sword, which comes out of the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and the birds that fly in mid-heaven are called by an angel standing in the sun to feed upon their flesh. And this goes back to, to, um, to an Old Testament, Ezekiel's prophecy of the judgment of Gog, um, which is seen in chapter 39 of Ezekiel. And you can go back and you can read that as well. Um, and we also see in verse 20, this whole, the two of them being thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And, 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 and this is only a more... Um, this is kind of a, a concept 
a developed form, I should say, a developed form of the Jewish concept of uh, Johanna. And you know, Johanna was always seen as a furnace of fire for the Jews. And so this fiery lake is a more developed form of the whole, of this same Johanna that we're talking about, that is mentioned here. And one thing you must realize that when it comes to lake, this lake in Revelation is a place of final punishment of the wicked. Um, and it is different from the bottomless pit, as one of you have read, or the pit of the abyss, and in, which is often seen as where Satan lives. Um, but what this whole lake symbolizes and signifies is, is that there will be a triumphant uh, there will be a triumphant victory. There will be a victory, I should say, um, over the world power, which is the, fir the first beast, and the world religion, which is the second beast. And, and now that those have been destroyed, the only one that is left to destroy now is Satan himself. Um, and, and we are going to come into more about Satan shortly. Um... What else do I want to mention there? Um, I th is there anyone, any questions for that other section of chapter 19? I would, I would add that some people think when they hear this about the beasts and the fiery lake and they're burning and all of that and the army, Christ coming with his army, a lot of folks see that as the Christ's second coming, some, um, called a parousia. Um, Although I am not sure that is a true interpretation, that it is Christ's second coming at that point in time. Um, because, and the reason is, it doesn't really correspond to the way it is described of Christ's coming in the Synoptic Gospels and um, in the Epistles. Um, but it more so seems to describe uh, what can be seen as Christ's conflict with the world. Um, and it um, um, and it is and that is shown forth uh, in the beginning with the seals, the seven seals, where Christ goes forward to conquer. Um, but to say that it is the second coming itself that it that it um, it portrays that um, there is still the jury is still out on that since we are not seeing the interpretation to say that that is the case um, conclusively. I have a question. Yes, Lorraine. Why would Christ come with an army? What would that look like? If Christ comes with an army, what would it look like, you ask? Well, first of all, why would Christ come with an army? And if so, what would that look like? Um, the, 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 Assuming that it's not what it sounds like on the surface. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is about it is one cannot, when one see it as Christ coming with an army, it, always, it is meant to depict that, that victory is eminent. Uh, whether or not he is coming with a real army is, an, is another story. But, but the whole symbolism behind it is that when Christ comes, he's going to be victorious. He's going to conquer. Um, and, 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 we may, and, and, and as we worship God, uh, we know that God doesn't need an army to do all this sort of stuff. And so, and so I cannot, except, except for what I used to see in the storybooks, I cannot think that in the Bible storybooks. Um, yeah. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't perceive it as, um, if, if you want me to tell you, I don't perceive it as some big army coming. I think Christ can do it all on his own and um, God can do it all on his own, but it is symbolic of victory is eminent that there will be um, conquering of evil, the triumph of good over evil. I have a question. Yes, Carol. Um, if the first beast is world power, mm -hmm. The second beast is world religions. I think I, I think that's a little more clear to me what that means. Mm -hmm. What does world power exactly mean? 
governments, the world, uh, yes, the world power, those who are in control, those who have their kingdoms, who have the their governments, that is where the world power is. Um, and, 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 and if you realize the, the, the second beast um, is the one who misguides to help others, to help, no, let me, let me rephrase that. The second beast is the one who misguides the populace so that they will follow the world power. Mm -hmm. so, in, so in other words, the, wor the world religions are not, are not the religions that are faithful to Christ, of course not, but they're the ones who are more or less in the pockets of, of, of governments. And, and you see that happening in some of our religions where, um, mm -hmm. you, you get where I'm coming from? Where yeah necessarily islam buddhism um, it does not necessarily mean that at all yeah. and that it does not not not, not that it cannot but mm -hmm. um it means any religion that is not faithful to god to god in christ mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what do you mean by like not faithful like not not obeying God, like saying not, not obeying God. Not, not, not following what they should be. And we're talking, remember now, we're talking about religions, not following what is expected of them as far as their relationship with God and each other is concerned. Um, and, 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 and what you may be having is, is that religions who are promoting more what governments want what governments present what society presents and so you mean like you mean like more hatred than um correct than love. correct and, and it goes be it goes deeper than hatred it, be, it goes it goes into you know the whole i mean i'm trying to think of a, some of the words to, 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 to mention. i would say racism as well too and 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 that could be one of them yeah, they have a that, political. They have a political, a political agenda. agenda. And a political agenda, exactly. And, and you those, see that today. And you see that today coming from religions, exactly. um, so so as to so as to promote governments, and 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 to, and and so yes, we all of that is encompassed in that whole notion of world but, religion versus well, world yeah. powers. So but don't they know that's pathetic. illegal? However, wait, 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 wait. hold on a minute, Bryce. Bryce, Bryce, hold on one second. Um, Lorraine first, and then Bryce. Go ahead, I said, Lorraine. So it's somewhat prophetic. Hmm. It's somewhat prophetic. Oh yes, it is. And the yeah. thing is about it. And the thing about is it with Revelation is, and and I, and I always say this to folks, it isn't to say that some of the things that are happening in in Revelation isn't happening in our society, or that has happened before hundreds of years ago, or that will happen a hundred years later. Um, things that are happening in Revelation are happening. The, the, the thing about it is, is uh, we, we, we need to be careful how we put it together, because then there are some folks who go out and they think, oh, well, this is happening, then that means that, and that is happening, that means that, and, and they start putting their own spin to everything, and we need to be careful and, 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 and cognizant and, and of, of that. But yes, there are things that are taking place that are happening in Revelation that are happening in our world, has happened, is happening, and will continue to happen. Yes. Yes, Bryce. Sorry. Is it like, is it like, but don't they know what they're doing is however illegal because they don't really care about hurting other people? And that's all part of it. And that is all part of it. That is all part of it. So they're being selfish. Well, and we know that that is something that um, lots of us are. We don't even have to be world religions or world powers. We just have to be individuals, and we do that. You know, <laughs> and, and it's because of indi and it's because that we are individuals and we are like that is what helps promote that. Um, the, the fact that the fact that we see this happening, it starts from us ourselves. It's exploited. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, let's move on now to chapter 20.
And the whole notion of this whole notion of a thousand years and the whole notion of Satan and, and what's going to happen to him. And, and, and we see here in chapter 20 that there, and, and, and I know um, it, it seems, well, it seems like a, a, a soap opera drama kind of thing where, uh, you know, why doesn't God just get rid of Satan and done with that? But here, yeah, why doesn't he just put him in prison? What, so, but what you're going to see <laughs> and lock him up and throw away the key and torture what you, him easily. <laughs> what what you what you're going to see here is is that there is a temporary note that word use a word temporary destruction of Satan's power, um, and that he's being bound for a period of time, um, um, but he is not destroyed completely at this point. <laughs> why not? This sounds so familiar. <laughs> Why not? Is he not Why can't God destroy him? Explain that, Lorraine, when you say this. No, sounds... I, no it... I won't go there. It's not a okay. <laughs> But this is what has happened. Is that there's, you're going to see a temporary destruction of Satan's power. Um, um, him being bound for a period of time. But, um, but it also shows a, a sequence of triumphal events to take place as well. So let's start with verses one, verses one and to three. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years, any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. And, and so we see here um, this whole notion of, of this angel coming from heaven um, um, with this chain, this symbolic chain to bind up um, Satan. Um, um, and, and the period that he's going to be bound up is for a thousand years. And remember, uh, and I will tell you, there are people who think a thousand years really mean a thousand years. Um, That's a long um, time. But, uh, but again, um, uh, we, we, we better not talk about a thousand years, as I always say, you know, a thousand years is like a day to God. So, so yeah, you, it sounds you, like, you, so it sounds like forever. So, so it, it, it sounds like Satan is punished forever. Yeah. So it's, it's for a period of time, a long period of time. And he's being shut in this ab, um, abyss, which is his present dwelling place. Um, and, and, um, and he will be he will be restrained until the end of that time. Now, the one of the couple of things we need to note is that is that the binding of Satan indicates that there is a limit to his authority over the nations. So not that he, there's going to be really chains locking him up, but that there's going to come a time where his authority over the nations will be limited um, and, and that there will be an ushering in of the triumph of the gospel among people. Another thing we need to also recognize is, is that there is a partial promise that is being taken place, is being fulfilled, but it has not yet reached its completion. The final consummation has not taken place. And also that limiting Satan's power, it prepares us for the events that are to follow. And it precedes what is called the first resurrection. As you realize, we're going to come to that. We heard about the first resurrection and the second resurrection. And so this whole limiting of Satan's power, his authority um, is uh, as a means of ushering in um, a, 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 a sort of victory among God's people. Now, let us look at verses four to six. I saw thrones on which were seated those who have been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads 
or, or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So here we have this whole notion now of a thousand years, and we have this whole notion of a first resurrection. And this first resurrection, the resurrection, which is the effective redemption of the body from death, that is necessary for complete victory over sin and this whole final and full consummation of man's life in eternity is now at this point beginning. And what we are seeing here in Revelation is two successive stages. One, we see um, the, uh, uh, the, the first accompanying the triumph of the messianic kingdom. And the second is a preparation to the final judgment. Um, um, and, and one of the things I will put, I will just say here, say here is, is that the fact that the, resurre that the resurrection is constantly emphasized in the New Testament because it is, um, but it is entirely unnecessary for us to inquire into the manner of the resurrection. For in the, for in the New Testament, it is no way revealed how the resurrection or the manner into that resurrection. It is quite enough for us to know that there will be a resurrection and that the new body will be a spiritual body. But let's look at these two, these, let's look at the first resurrection. And there are, and these two parts of the resurrection are separated in this whole vision by this millennial, what we can call a millennial period. Um, and, and this is as far as I talk about these last things. So let me, let me, just, let me just back up a minute uh, because we are talking about the seven last things now. And we realize that the first last thing was the end of the holy war. The second last thing is the whole notion of Satan being bound. Now we are into the first resurrection. And, and this first resurrection is special. And it consists of certain, consistent of certain saints and martyrs who, because they endured the forces of evil in their lives and death, they are judge worthy to attain resurrection. So in other words, these are the people who have been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. These are the martyrs who have been killed for the word of God. These are the people who did not worship the beast, nor his image, nor receive his mark on their heads or on their hands. And one of the things I want to say to you is, because this is a question before I even continue, this is a question that I get often from people. How do you think resurrection will be in judgment? And, um, and, and uh, well, I, I wasn't. I was. It was. It, I wasn't asking you to give me an answer, Bryce. Although, if you have an answer, you could. <laughs> but, but what I, what, what I'm, what, what I wanted to say is, is that oftentimes we think of resurrection as everybody can rise the same time, and 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 judge and go to heaven or hell or whatever you want to call it. But the Bible tells us about various that resurrection seem to be a process when i say a process there will be various stages of resurrection that every it is not going to happen all at the same time but that there are those who have already resurrected and there are those who are still to be resurrected and and I've always said to folks this, I told them this because they always said to me, do you think it's going to be one this way or it's going to be how do you expect? And I said, personally, from my recollection of the scriptures, resurrection is already taking place. Um, um, so, so, and I will, and I will, and I will show you why I feel that based on, on what I've seen in scriptures as we go down, as we go down the, the thing. Um, um, and so, and so, and so this first resurrection is obviously limited to a certain group of people um, um, who are being redeemed because of the evil that took place 
against them and they withstanded that evil and they were and they were able to and they're now being rewarded for their martyrdom so people who were martyrs um, um, will have part in this resurrection and should live with, with Christ and reign with Christ through this long period of time that they call a thousand years. Some call it a millennial era. Um, they share in Christ's presence and glory as a reward for their faithfulness um, and, 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 and be with him where he is evidently in heaven. Um, and so we have that. Um, those re the redeemed saints who should live and reign with Christ, who should enter into this new and fuller life with Christ, um, um, uh, and who will be part of that triumphant, uh, being triumphant um, with Christ in heaven. And so, and so, and so, that is the first resurrection. Um, in which here John's vision speaks about, and that is going to go on for quite some time before the second resurrection comes about. Um, um, I'm looking for something here. Hold on a second. Okay, I, I, I mentioned that in the, res in the second resurrection, so we'll get to that. And when they talk about that they shall be priests of God and of Christ, it does not mean that they will exercise the function of mediators for the rest of mankind during that millennial period. Um, but, that, and, but what it means is that they have been granted access to fellowship with God and with Christ in the same way how priests drew near to God and Christ under the old covenant. And they stand in the presence of the priests of old. So it is just uh, it's just a metaphorically meaning not that they will be mediators, but that they will have a closer fellowship um, with Christ and with God, like how priests do. Then the fourth of the last things is what is called the millennial uh, or the millennium. And it comes obviously from that Latin word um, uh, mill. Um, meaning a thousand, a thousand annas, meaning years. And it is, and it's now become a part in Christian thought. And it is, as I said, it is taken literally by some as meaning a thousand years, while others interpret it metaphorically as a long period, uh, a long and undetermined period of time, whatever that is, whatever it is decided by God. And there are three basic approaches to this subject of the millennial. There is a term called the amillennialism, um, which is, um, uh, it describes the present reign of Christ in heaven over his, his um, realm, um, which also include the souls of those believers who, um, who we were just talking about. Um, and the present form of God's kingdom will be followed by Christ's return, which is the general rev which is the general resurrection, which is the final judgment, and and Christ continuing um, reign over the kingdom on earth in an eternal way. So we have that period where Christ is presently reigning in heaven over his realm, um, and this whole period of of our length of time by the millennium is a period of multi, is a period of completeness, um, um, covering a long period that will stretch for generations to come, during which the rule of Christ shall be triumphant, triumphantly established on the earth. Um, so we have that period. Then we also have a period called pre-millennialism. Um, which is the present form of God's kingdom, moving toward that climax, that grand climax when Christ will return. Um, the first resurrection will occur, and his resurrection will find expression 
in the visible reign of peace and righteousness on earth. And one of the things that we need to also understand about this first resurrection is, is that first resurrection does not mean again as well, that it will happen all at one time. It could be happening, like for example, we had persons who were martyred before years ago that we celebrate as saints today. Um, um, you mean like, first the first resurrection will include them. Um, even you today, mean like St. Stephen. Correct. Before, correct. Oh, like, you know, like when he was getting stoned to death by Saul. Correct. And then even, and then even people today who, who, will, who are still professing Christ, who are still um, um, dying because they will not deny Christ, they too could also be a part of what is called the first resurrection. Because you remember, mean like... Do you mean like Paul was resurrected and he was forgiven by Jesus and he became, Saul became Paul and he became a better person in the end? Well, n- n- well, not quite in terms of in this, I'm not talking about that in, in this particular instance when it comes to resurrection. What I'm talking about is, is that what John is seeing here of this first resurrection is people who have been so faithful to Christ, people who have died for Christ, who have given their lives for Christ, that they are part of this first resurrection that is going to take place. And that it is not a one-time thing, but it is something that will take over a period of time. And, and what I was saying just now is, is that all that um, it could have already started with people like um, St. Peter, or all those red saint days that we see, St. Peter, St. Paul, St. Paul, St. Barnabas, and all of them that we see with red letter days, they are part of the first resurrection. But I'm also saying that people even today or in recent years who are so faithful, who fought for Christ, <coughs> who preached the word and even were told if they don't stop, they will be killed and they died for Christ, they too can be also part of that first resurrection because they have been faithful to, to Christ. You, you understand what I'm saying here? Everybody understand yes. me? Yes, yes, I understand. What I know I saw, I saw Carol came forward out of her chair. Like she has a thought and I know Marilyn, everybody, Lorraine. Okay, just want to make sure you're on board. Um, um, so this whole pre-millennial period um, um, is when you, is a, is a time where um, God's kingdom is moving towards that climax when there will be peace and righteousness on the earth, when there will be a final resurrection, where there will be a last judgment, where there will be um, a, a renewing of the heavens and new earth and, and all this kind of, of stuff. Um, and so all of this um, will, will take place. There are some who think that maybe, uh, you know, that this pre-millennial um, time, um, that the resurrection, the first resurrection, will come before that time. Um, but again, there is no, 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 no um, um, definitive proof that that will be the case. And then there's the post-millennialism, which is when the world will eventually become, um, 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 some call it Christianized. Um, uh, resulting in a long period of peace and prosperity, and it will be um, will will see usher in second coming of Christ, the, re- the second resurrection, the resurrection of the dead, the judgment, and the and and then the eternal state. And then when we come to um, um, the fifth. Um, um, the fifth of the last things, the fifth last thing uh, we see in chapter 20, verse 7 to 10, where it talks about Satan's um, overthrown. Um, we read here, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They march across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. 
But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So here we are seeing now that Satan has gone through this long period of being bound. He's loose again, doing his thing again. Have a, <laughs> he, he, hasn't, he hasn't realized yet that you're... That, yeah, he's you getting know, more and, and more and, trouble. And so now we see now that he is, he is back out and he's still going about his evil ways and trying to destroy Yeah, he God. probably has like the nicotine of a cigarette in his mouth and he can't stop it. <laughs> I mean, it's just possible he might have had a cigarette in his mouth smoking, and he's probably having a drug in his mouth, and he can't stop it. Yeah. So, so we see Satan coming out of the abyss and going about doing um, destruction again. Um, and the whole notion of Gog and Magog. Um, which here is is um, symbolized as the nations um, of the world, um, and that and that goes back to again. If you were going to Ezekiel chapters thirty eight and thirty nine, you will see there's the symbolism is found in the Old Testament invasion of Gog, um, which is a prophetic scene of war, which lasts, which becomes the last struggle between the sin and those who, those who are sinful and those who are righteous and you can you can read that there yeah i mean it's like it's like god does forgive people no matter what they do like 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 he got angry at the jewish settlers after they came over from egypt to israel and they rebelled against moses and then and then they were killed by the 10 commandments of the thunder and lightning and then God forgave them even after they were dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why did he forgive them? Is there because, a reason why he forgave because, them after because, they were dead, yeah. like even Nathan? Because he's love. That's what he does. But that's what he does. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, now when we come to the second resurrection, which is chapter 20, verse 11, um, verses 11 down to verses 13. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his, dis from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. So we have here the final and complete resurrection, which is going to, which is um, occurring at the end of the world. It will comprise all those who, whether believers or not, who fail to participate in the first resurrection. So whereas you will see there's a resurrection, a first resurrection, of those who were faithful. Now we are coming now to a second resurrection where um, both believers and unbelievers are going to be judged and are going, are going to be resurrected and going to be judged. And, and, you, and then you're gonna see even the sea give up the bodies of the dead um, and, in, and even death and Hades give up the souls of the dead that were in them. Um, um, in preparation for judgment. And we have this description of a second or general resurrection, which presents the ordinary view of scripture, while that of the first resurrection introduces a new, a different concept, um, that of a special resurrection. And the main distinction between the two resurrections may be regarded as chiefly one of order rather than time, um, um, though the precedence of the first in point of time is also included. Um, but in each case, a resurrection of the body is meant, but the first is partial in extent, um, consisting of a particular group of people, while the second is universal, comprising of all groups of people. Um, and one of the things I wanted to share with you is... Um, and, 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 and the reason why there's always this hint of the resurrection um, occurring in 
more than one period or at least two periods, first and second, if you want to call it that, is something that we also see in light of events that took place in scripture. Now, I mean, um, when we go to the Old Testament, it is believed that the translation of Enoch and Elijah um, um, in the Old Testament, that there are an equivalent to uh, immediate resurrection, which anticipate the victory of Christ over death. Um, so, so here we have these two folks who translated into heaven um, um, and, 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 and that is seen as a form of resurrection. Uh, we, we, we see it happening in, in the closing chapter of Daniel. Although it's a little bit more obscure, it points to a stage in the resurrection in which not all but many shall rise and includes as well those who rise to shame and everlasting contempt. Um, though there's no indication of the you time. Mean it's like, you, you mean it's like very complicated at the end? Um, this is in Daniel. Is up, yeah, it is. It is. It is. Um, but also, too, when we read in Matthew's account of the crucifixion of our Lord, you remember in Matthew chapter 27, we read, uh, let me get it for you. Uh, let me read it for you. Matthew 27. Um, let me see. Matthew 27. What verse am I looking for? <laughs> Yes, um, and it, you see here in Matthew chapter 27, starting at verse 50, we read, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rock split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. There came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So here we see another kind of form of resurrection taking place. When Jesus died, um, um, people coming forth, saints, the bodies of saints that had fallen asleep were raised and coming forth of the, of the tombs after his resurrection and appearing to many people. So... These kinds of passages, I know there's also a belief, and I mean, uh, I, I don't know if it's, it can't be, I don't know if it's proven, but even Moses' grave in the valley of the, in the land of Moab, um, there is some adequate explanation that he too may have been translated um, um, or resurrected um, afterwards there's also that uh, the roman church believed that is what happened to the blessed virgin mary um, um that she too has been translated resurrected into heaven um so 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 the point i'm trying to make is is that um whereas there are people who have the view that resurrection <coughs> there will be only one general resurrection that will take place at the end of time it is quite likely that that is not the case, that resurrection takes place and, and, and where God is, where, where there are folks who have already been resurrected, but it appears that they will be the ones who are the, those who are really the faithful folks who have really suffered as a result of their faithfulness to God. Um, but then there will be a second resurrection where both those who are faithful but also those who were not faithful will also be um, judged as well. And then the seventh of the last things is the last judgment, which we read in verses, the, the whole situation, the verses 11 to 15, where we're talking, where we talk about and standing before the throne and books were open and, and another book was open, which is the book of life and the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead and so forth that they were in them and each person was judged according to what he had done. The death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So here we find now that there is a judgment to take place 
that the, that the dead, both small and great, will stand before God to be judged after the resurrection is completed. And, and, uh, and this whole notion of, and there are two, two um, principles of the judgment, um, that one, you judge according to the, your works, um, and the second, according to the divine purpose, which is written in the book of life. So, um, so and, and this whole notion of the book of life was originally the name that was used more or less like a roll call of the Jewish citizens. Um, um, and this was done sometime before Christ. And, and you can, and, and I think there's mention of it in Ezra and Nehemiah, um, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, um, but it's now applied to the Lamb's Book of Life, uh, which will be the role, a kind of like a roll call of these new citizens who will be a part of the New Jerusalem. Um, so where, that's where the Book of Life came from. Originally, it was used for Jewish citizens um, before the time of Christ. And Ezra and Nehemiah speaks about that. Um, I and, and, and the only other thing I will say is, is that obviously the judgment is the last event of time to take place. Um, and then after the judgment, you will, you will know your eternal state, your eternal, uh, yeah, your eternal state. You would then trans, transition, um, uh, people will transition either into eternity with God in heaven or eternity in hell. And, 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 and um, uh, always remembering that hell is not what God wants for any of us, and, um, but what we may choose for ourselves. So any questions? Well, no, so quiet. Yes. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Carol. So there are saints and martyrs who are documented, but there are probably a lot of people who did the same things that are not documented. Correct. Go, bring your question. Go ahead. That I guess would face the same thing. Correct. Um, and I agree with you. I agree. And yes uh, means when you say, you know, you'll be surprised about who you meet in heaven and hell. Correct. That this correct. Is those people. correct. correct. I agree with you wholeheartedly. That's why I said earlier that, you know, although we have the ones that we know about that are the red letter days um, and white letter days in, 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 on our calendars, there are still, I believe, people up to now who, will, who are a part of that, um, of, of that res resurrection, who will be a part of that resurrection um, because of the kind of lives that they live and the way how they, they fought for Christ and they, they, they believe in him even at the expense of their lives. Yeah, I mean, like that's a I mean, profound like a, level of faithfulness. Yeah, I mean, it says like Saint John the Baptist said to King Herod, he's like, "It is not lawful for your brother to have an affair with your wife." And he said to him, "Like that is none of your damn business at all, at all, John." <laughs> yeah. So you know, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is one of it is one of those things that we have to. So I don't know if I answer your question, Carl, but um, but yes. Um, um, it is not only those who are on our calendar. It, it, it involves peoples whose hearts were faithful to God and those who will, who will, will give their lives for him. Um, there's a joke that was told to me many years ago, and I don't remember if I'll get it, so I, I probably wouldn't get the punchline that well, but where the whole the people were in church, um, church was full of people, and these three masked men came in with guns, and, what? That's terrible. And, and, and shouted in the church, those um, who believe in Christ, um, we, uh, no, how did it go? Those, we're, we are here to shoot all those who believe in Christ. What? That's, and, that's horrible. And, that's illegal. You can't even do that. Okay, okay, hold on, Bryce. Hold on, hold on. And, um, and the, the majority of the people in this church scamper. And ran out. And after they all ran out, they, the gunman look at the pastor and say, no, these are your real faithful Christians. What is that, Kendrick? 
and the, the, the gunman said to the pastor after the majority of people had left because, you know, it, it, because they had said, you know, those who are faithful to Christ, um, if you remain, we're going to shoot you. And the majority of the church ran out. And after they ran out, the ones that remain, the, gunman's, the gunman said to the pastor, now these that are remain are your real faithful Christians. And they, yeah, and, they, like... and they left and they left the church and walk out. They didn't kill anybody. They just left the church and walk out. Well, unfortunately, so, so when the gunman said... killed the people out in Oswald, Norway, they didn't walk out. They killed everybody yeah. Yeah. in the Christian yeah. church. Yeah. So the point I'm trying to make is, is that you could, t- the, 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 the first resurrection are for those who are willing to die for Christ. Um, the second resurrection will be for everybody else. Will be for everybody. Yes, and those people in that in that Episcopal Church in Norway were willing to die for Christ. They didn't care they were going to get killed. Mm-hmm. They didn't even care about the consequences. The pastor decided to continue the service, even though the gunman was going to kill everybody. Mm-hmm. And so you know, and yes, uh, thank you, Bryce. But and and so you know, it is. The, the, this is where we see this whole notion of these two, two, two resurrections, a first and a second, a special and a general. Um, and as I said, and I don't think it is as, as what's the word I want? And I don't even think it is as stringent as just two. I, I think it's more of, I, I, I personally are of, is, is of the feeling that resurrection takes place periodically where people are in heaven with God already. I personally yeah. believe that. And, um, and, and, I, and, and that there will be another one, um, another major one to follow. But I think it happens. It has already happened. Yeah, it's like that gunman who killed, uh, who killed all those people in Bible study at the church. Um, and the only one that survived was that six-year-old boy in, in Charleston, South Carolina. Mm-hmm. To me, that was a miracle. Like, how did that boy survive? And the rest of the people were all murdered, including his mother and father. Mm-hmm. That doesn't make sense. How did he survive? Yeah. You got to ask God that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, mean, like, so, I mean, like, I mean, it wasn't well, his like time to said, die, but. Like you said, it was a miracle. It was a miracle. Yeah. It was a miracle. But he well, survived. This has, been a, this has been a really interesting discussion. I don't think a whole lot about it. And um, now you're giving me some food for thought. Yes, right. Okay, and I am glad that, that you do you think because, as I said, most people don't think of the, both. Most people don't think that resurrection may already be happening. Um, and here, John speaks about it. Um, um, and there's and there's reasoning in the Bible that it happens. So, so yeah. I've never had like a, a, a real serious picture of how that's going to happen. Um, mm. And so you've given me some yeah. Um, yeah. thoughts about it. Anyway. Yeah. It's just... Any other questions before Carol disappear with her yeah, battery? I'm, yeah, I'm going <laughs> to <laughs> Oh yeah! Oh shoot! It's seven thirty-six already. Are okay. We having, are we having one more class? Or? Yes, next week. Okay. That, that's chapters tw- chapters twenty-one and tw- chapters twenty-one and twenty-two. Okay. All right. Yes. All right. I'm going to say good night. All right. Good night. Hey, I'm going to say good night to everyone too. I'm thank you so. Nice thank you so I much. You Wait. Hold on a minute, Marilyn. Yes, Marilyn. You, you just Very mute yourself, Marilyn. On. I need to talk to you a minute. Oh, you want to talk to me? Okay. Yeah. All right. I will stay on with Marilyn. Okay. Good night. Good night. Bye.